Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session, The Science of Popularity, Content Demand in Latin America, sponsored by Parrot Analytics. Please welcome our moderator, Senior Contributing Editor at World Screen News, Elizabeth Guider. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you can hear us, right? Yes, okay. Uh, well, I am uh, honored to be here to uh, moderate this uh, panel with these very interesting executives. Um, I have not been to NatB. I'm, a, I'm an entertainment journalist based in Los Angeles. I have not been to NatB for the last three years. So I was very struck this morning uh, by a number of things I heard either on the market floor or at other panels. And the first one was probably best uh, articulated by uh, Andy Kaplan, who is, I think, the chairman of the board of uh, NatB, who said, and, and he indeed has been coming to NatB for over 30 years, and he said that the, the rate of change in this industry has absolutely never been greater. And I think that's something we all feel and we, you know, we all fear and we're all having great fun with, all of those things. I guess the second thing was something that I had been thinking about over the last year or two when we see all the big announcements about what's happening in our, in our industry, not only in the United States, but in Latin America, in Europe, and that is um, convergence and change and things that companies are doing that you never thought they would before. And one panelist this morning on the investor panel said that uh, companies are now moving into other lanes. They're not staying in their lanes. Think of the analogy, well, in LA, we would think of the analogy of the, of the 405 freeway, okay? It is a free-for-all. And if you change lanes too erratically, or if you fail to see that something's about to hit you and you never change lanes, um, you're liable to have a wreck, right? So that's kind of what's happening with companies. Uh, we're seeing them grapple with that whole need to, you know, should I grow, should I be sold, should I buy someone? You see Disney and Fox, I mean, who would have thought two years ago? We see AT&T, this telco, trying to take over one of the iconic major studios in Hollywood. All these kinds of things are happening on so many levels. And I think the third thing and this may be the elephant in the room, and I don't mean just this room physically, but the elephant in the room is, what do you do when you have content without borders now, but not necessarily the best ways to measure how viewers are consuming this content? And so I think uh, measurement and how we, how we analyze measurement, how we get it, how we predict what viewers like. It's no longer about counting eyeballs, is it? It's about a whole array of things that are supposedly going to help us figure out how to commission product, how to produce it, how to distribute it, how to market and promote it, and for not just an audience, but so many different audiences. So the complications of this business are fascinating and um, amazing, and they do keep changing. And I, I want to introduce our panelists who are at the forefront of trying to figure out all of these things at once. Uh, we have Adriana Cisneros, who is the CEO of the Cisneros Group, as you know, a major player in Venezuela, but also in, um, in uh, all of Latin America, and now in Miami, dealing with the American market and indeed the global market. Uh, Bruce Tuckman is a longtime key executive uh, who has worked for companies as diverse as Nickelodeon, AMC, MGM, et cetera. I think you're even a lawyer. <laughs> anyway, all of these things, and he has now re and recently set up his own company uh, eponymously named the Tuckman Global Ventures. And thirdly, we have Warid Sager, who is the CEO and co-founder of Parrot Analytics. Uh, and indeed, they are one of these 
disrupting, if you like, companies that's trying to come up with uh, ways to measure, predict, uh, go deeper into what it is that audiences, consumers on all, all continents are getting at, what they like, what they're going to like, and how executives can use this material better. And he has a presentation for us that's going to sort of set, set the stage for further questions about all of this. So, Warren, if you want to. Thanks, Thanks Elizabeth. Uh, yeah. All right, can everyone hear me? So there's one thing about the 3 p.m. panels is that, you, you know, you, it's, I've been to too many panels where it's, a lot of it is um, it's a one-way information flow, and the only information that we get here on the panel is the cues, I think, on people's faces. So can everyone hear us? Okay. All right, fantastic. Um, probably 60% awake, you know, <laughs> looking around the room. All right, cool. Um, so my name is Ward, and uh, I'll give a quick overview about paraanalytics, what it is that we do, what this panel um, is, is trying to discuss, as, not as eloquently as, as Elizabeth uh, put it, but, you know, we're all seeing a lot of the trends and, and the movements, and I'm seeing a lot of ads up here um, before we started about, you know, cross-platform measurement and measuring audiences and lots of companies uh, that have been trying to do this for many, many, many decades um, that are still trying to do this. Um, but so let's just recap really, really quickly what we're seeing around the industry. Uh, we're seeing really rapid proliferation of content distribution platforms um, across those platforms. You know, here in the U.S. we talk about Amazon and Hulu and Netflix, and, and, but actually there are thousands of over-the-top platforms around the world, literally thousands. We work with telcos that are each launching like three SVOD and, and AVOD platforms. Um, really rapid proliferation of those platforms. What that means is now audiences are no more fragmented than ever. I'm a subscriber to a number of different ESVO platforms, but I also you know, watch live TV and so on, which means viewers now consume content on lots of different uh, disparate places, uh, which means our, our ability as an industry uh, more than ever um, is to, to measure these audiences becoming more and more limited because we can't see within a lot of these places where their viewership happens, which means to get a holistic view of what is happening across the industry, across those platforms, is really, really difficult. And now, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what the industry is still trying to do, as I was reminded by a lot of the ads here um, before the panel, is, is, is trying to panel its way through to knowing or seeing that viewership across those platforms, right? We're still taking that approach, or some people in the industry are still taking the approach of, well, if we can just get like 50,000 people, a panel of 50,000 smart TVs, and then measure what they watch across platforms, and we can extrapolate that to 400 million people and, uh, and see what is happening. Well, are you going to panel your way through to thousands of ESVO platforms in every country on the planet? You're gonna panel your way through to every ESVO platform in Venezuela and in Japan and in South Africa. It's not it's not scalable, and so that whole approach of we're gonna panel our way through to uh, understanding what's happening, uh, what audiences are doing, just isn't keeping up pace with the empirical um, uh, direction that the industry is hitting in. So at the heart of that is this relationship between consumers and content, which um, we're gonna have this conversation about, and this relationship takes many different shapes, ways, and forms, and what I'll, I'll give a brief overview of what some of these, um, what shapes some of these forms uh, take, and, uh, and give you some examples. So at the, heart of, at the heart of that relationship between content and consumers is this question, what is popular? And that question, that very question, you were talking about it before the panel, the, 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 the very question, the very, definition of popularity is now changing. And when Andy rightly put it that the you know, rate of change, that pace is, is changing faster than ever, um, consider this. If you ask someone, what is, what, 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 how do you define a popular TV show 10 years ago, not even 20 years ago, you would have largely, nine out of 10 people would have given you the same answer. And now, suddenly, it's almost like we woke up overnight to a world where popularity is in the eye of the beholder, where you ask a linear network, what is, how do you find popularity? And they tell you my linear ratings. I live and die by those. That's all I care about. As far as I'm concerned, that's what popularity is to me. You ask an ESVA platform, they couldn't care less about the linear ratings. In fact, it's not even about consumption or engagement on their platform. It's actually about customer growth and retention, or reducing churn on their platform. And so suddenly, this, you know, uh, we, we, I said that once the popularity is out in the beholder, and it's really, really true that different people now define what is popular differently. So, our approach to this is this concept of global content demand. Basically, we set out to measure the demand for content, and that demand takes many different 
um, shapes and, 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 and forms. And so here's a quick example of just what is that, that we do? How do we define demand for content, which is our measure of the intent to view, the intent to purchase. Um, and we call it demand because it's taking, the, the form that it takes is different. For example, if I watch three back-to-back -back episodes of a TV show, I'm expressing my demand for that TV show. But equally, if I read about it on Wikipedia, I'm also expressing my demand for it. It's just that there are different forms of demand that I'm expressing for it. And so, essentially, what Paranalytics does is we capture all of those different forms of demand, and then we say, let's actually combine them. So we've come up with a system whereby, you know, if you watch three back-to-back -back episodes of a TV show, that is a much stronger indication of demand than if you tweet about it. Right, like you just invested three hours watching a TV show, that's a stronger signal than like pressing like on a Facebook page or, or retweet on a tweet. And so we capture all the various forms of expressions of demand from billions of people online, and then we weight every single expression according to how much demand it represents, which by the way solves a lot of challenges around duplicity, solves a lot of problems around, uh, sometimes you have a small group of fans that are hyper vocal, you know, a lot of um, of our clients have problems with social media where a small group of fans are hyper vocal about like a, a given number of shows. Um, our demand, we say, well, just because they're loud, that doesn't mean there's high demand for the show, right? Again, just because you tweet a lot about a TV show, that doesn't mean you're expressing a lot of demand for it as opposed to um, a much broader audience which could be passively consuming a show. And so the show still has a high, a high demand, but, um, and we'll, I know we'll come back to that later on. Let me ask session. you just yeah. this because I'm Please. sure it must be in other. So, do you sit around a table and decide how you are going to proportionalize all of those different um, aspects, or is it all done by algorithms? How, how does that? Yeah. It started, How does that work in a simple answer? Well, it started, it started by a bunch of people around a table, like the four okay. of us. And, okay. and that's why you know, I think we smartly went out and got people like Adriana, like Bruce, who have been in the industry for much, much longer than, than we have started in the company as a bunch of scientists because uh, we wanted to ask that question. Like, actually, what is an important indication of demand? What is, uh, is, is watching a TV show a stronger... Like, we can, everyone in this room can probably agree that watching an entire episode of a TV show is a stronger indication of your demand than, like, writing a comment on Facebook, right? So, but then there are more nuanced um, signals that are more closer. Like, is, is writing a comment a strong indication of demand than reading a Wikipedia page? Uh, you know, uh, yes or no, different people have different answers. So it started with a group of people who, you know, industry leaders who between them said, um, this is the overall, uh, the overarching framework for how we weight these things. Um, and then it, it, then it moved on to a machine learning system, okay. which now, you know, the second part of your question is, now it is it's algorithmically done whereby these signals are weighted, but also the system is learning over time. So we've been fine tuning for the past four or five years, and the system is now fine tuning. And we do a lot of correlation studies with actual consumption as well platforms and so on to always fine tune the system. So, uh, long story short, we capture all those, all those sources on the right here. So whether someone is blogging about a TV show, whether they're searching for it, whether they're reading about it, or they're commenting on it, they're discussing it online, whether they're watching it, um, whether they're pirating it, uh, rather whether they're on, you know, on, on photo sharing apps or, or microblogging about it. And then we say, let's wait all those signals and then combine them into a single measure. Um, so we process over a billion data points a day. We capture demand for content in every country on the planet. Um, and we cross over 100 languages a day, and then we roll that out as the industry's you know, only global cross-platform demand measurement system um, that quantifies that relationship between consumers and content. So um, I'll give you a quick dive, and then you know, we'll be a, more of a conversational approach. Is, so we can say, for example, let's use that system to understand what the top 10 shows were in Latin America over the last year, the last 12 months. Um, it's a big American heavy hitters that are at the top, and you're, we're starting to see more and more of the local language content um, actually creep up in the, in the, and, and compete with the top titles. Um, let's look at like, the top genres in Latin America over the past year, and um, we can see that here are some examples of each of those genres, like apocalyptic dramas and, and superhero series and so on. So ap apocalyptic dramas and historical adventures were by far the top two genres in, in Latin over the last year, the last 12 months. And then we say, then we can ask a question like, well, how does that, because it's a global system, let's benchmark an index around between Latin America compared to the rest of the world, right? So um, what you have, the axis here is against the global average. And one interesting thing, we were just talking to Adriana about it before the panel, is that I've noticed as, as we're diving deeper and deeper into the Latin American market, is that 
it's, it's a really an early adopter market. Um, people here, I think people around the world would be wise to see what audience trends are in, across Latin America and as an early signal of what is about to happen in, in other markets. For example, um, we're seeing Latin America uh, for the first, as probably the first continent where superhero fatigue um, is starting to mm. starting to show, right? And so, it under over 2017, un, under index not insignificantly against the global average um, in terms of yeah. the region's demand for superhero series. Um, we can also, because the system is cross-platform and people consume and talk about and pirate um, and read about and search for all types of content, we can look at like what are the top 10 SVOD titles in Latin. Um, and here you're seeing a lot more uh, local language titles um, show up in the in the top 10. We can do things like. Can we, uh, can we look at the top 10 titles, original series, on Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu, and uh, plot them against each other in the Latin m market? Um, and so we can see that Netflix, by far, has, a, has a, an, an early and, and significant lead against the others, at least as far as their top 10 shows are concerned. But here's the other example I talk about the, the audience in Latin America being an early adopter uh, market and also more digitally savvy and digitally mm -hmm. native is that if you look at the average popularity of the top 10 shows um, on Netflix, top 10 original series on Netflix, um, by, by region, North America, Latin, Europe, and Asia, um, the average in, across Latin is, is significantly higher across the entire 12 months than other regions. And so you're seeing these platforms, as well platforms, invest significantly in markets like Asia, whereas you compare the, the red line with the yellow line, um, and you can see that it's, 70% higher, there's a higher demand, 70% higher demand for the top 10 Netflix original series in Latin America than, um, than in Asia. And so the audience here are more digitally savvy, digi mm. they have uh, more native digital adoption, um, at least as far as the data is, is, is showing. Um, then we can look at, say for example, so this is the different slices and dices of like how we can use a global system to answer various business questions like um, how do ad historical adventures differ across countries like Argentina, um, and Brazil do really well in historical adventures, but Mexico and Chile don't um, over the past year. Now, it's interesting when you look at what happened over a five-year period, yeah. right? And then you will start to pick up trends where markets are heading towards, where markets are decreasing. Um, this is a really interesting concept. We do a lot of work with our clients around what we call travelability, the ha how content travels around the world. Um, so we can see that content that originates from Argentina, because we, ha we can see what the global demand is for all content, we can isolate just content that originates from Argentina and see how it, how it fares around the world, right? And then we can see that um, it travels expectedly so to Spanish-speaking markets, um, but also across Europe, um, actually. Now, in comparison, if you look at just the Portuguese content from Brazil and where it travels... Um, Portugal. Primarily, <laughs> right? It's, 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 and we can see this. Now, we can, we can show another slide of like Spanish dubbed uh, Portuguese content, and, yeah. and I expect that to travel further and wider um, than just Portuguese. But if you just look at the, por the content originating from Brazil in Portuguese, this is where it travels. You see some African countries showing up there as well. Um, and when you put them side by side, you can do this. Now, you can do this for, um, for example, uh, Marseille, a, 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 a French original series from Netflix, and then you can see against the home markets, like it's in Belgium and Senegal and Luxembourg, where mm -hmm. it travels, right? And then you can see uh, You Are Wanted. This is a German um, thriller uh, by Amazon, an original series. And then you can see that it actually, there's higher demand for it in Austria than there is in Germany, its home, in its home market. Um, and then you can look at a Spanish original show produced by Netflix, uh, original series, um, and then you can see how it travels across this, the Spanish coast of, of, of the Latin um, continent. So here's a different form of looking at, like di diving into this, this data, and I'll wrap up in, in, in two minutes now. So uh, basically we can look at a lot of our clients, obviously there's so many different um, sources of demand, like social media. A lot of people are looking at social media analysis and so on. But here's an example where Vikings is really, really popular in Brazil, right? Now, Look at that pie chart. 2% of the total demand expressed for Vikings in Brazil happens on social media, right? So if you just look at social media analysis for the show, you're, you would be led to wrongly believe that the show isn't really popular. It's not true. Um, it's really popular in Brazil, it's, but Brazilian fans of Vikings aren't as vocal about their demand for the show <laughs> as other fans in other countries, like in Panama and Spain and Peru and Paraguay, right? They're much more vocal about 
um, their, their love of the show than fans. And so this is just an example where you can't look at like one part of the, the, the pie and say, oh, we're just gonna look at social media to understand popularity. Well, you'll, you'll be missing like in this case, 98% of the full picture. Right. Um, then we can do all. We can slice and dice. For example, we can understand how are the audience feeling, so we can plot the mood over time by episode. Right. Um, not just the the emotion and the mood, but the the what do they feel and how strongly do they feel about it. Right. So we we you know we use a, a psychologist approach to there are eight different moods that drive our behavior. So we can see how audiences are feeling towards any particular TV show on an episode by episode basis down to a specific mood level. So we can see where their anticipation, for example, if you're a marketing team, you really want to build up anticipation leading up to a new season, right? You want that mood to be expressed the highest, right? And, and trust, whereas sometimes you see anger when the favorite character dies and so on. You don't want that, those feelings to linger. You want them to spike during an episode so people, people react to what's happening in the episode, right. but then it dies down afterwards. Otherwise, people damn disengage. No. There's lots and lots of different examples of how we delve into um, different slices and dices of content popularity, but I want to turn over to the panel now, um, and then we can show other stuff as we it's, go on. This is fascinating, and, and I will ask you more in a little while about affinity, because I don't think many companies have analyzed affinity, and yet that is what... That is, when you have a conversation with a friend, that is really what you're talking about. You know, your affinity for a genre, your affinity for a character, et cetera. But I, I wanted to ask uh, both uh, Adriana and Bruce, who have such almost opposite relationships with the Latin American market in that you are based in it, you, you know it from a, a producer point of view and a distributor point of view, and you have been in it selling both shows and channels, et cetera. So you kind of come at, it, come at it from two different perspectives. Adriana, you first. Here you are, the CEO of a major media company. Tell us a little bit about how it is that you felt that um, research and ratings, traditional ones that you were utilizing, your company was utilizing, was not really quite capturing what you knew to be happening uh, for your channels. And how has, how has these, this new set of data starting to influence your executive decisions? Sure. Um, so th the reason that, that Parrot became so interesting to me immediately the first time I ever met Ward was because uh, I was dragging with me uh, a sentiment of frustration from seeing how badly um, the rating agencies were working in Latin America. Uh, we actually made a, at our company 15 years ago, we made a decision to stop hiring a rating company because we knew that their data set was off. So in Latin America, the Nielsen's of the world um, haven't been paying attention and they haven't been investing in the region. Maybe they've been more focused in the US, maybe they've been focused in Asia. They have not been focused in Latin America. So let's say in any of these countries 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they put little machines in people's homes through which they're measuring what's happening in the, in the television. Few things are wrong with that. Um, to begin with, you know, Latin America has boomed and all of the major cities have grown organically, uh, which means that the definition of a city to begin with is very different from the definition that the they rating have. agencies had in terms of demographics and how people are spread and where people are living. That was the first problem that we encountered and why we knew that their measurings weren't accurate, but that gave us a window. And the more that we looked into that and were frustrated because of that, we also realized that our content was doing extremely well on online platforms. And this is way before all these things um, have been launched. Um, it was only YouTube back then. Um, and we were gaining all these insights um, in terms of how our content was traveling worldwide um, and how many millions of people were consuming it, uh, that we started to really, really pay attention to that data and realizing that there was so much value if we could find a way of aggregating um, all the activity that was being generated by our content, uh, both on the screen and on the digital side. And we're kind of, we're sort of a strange beast in the media world. Uh, I, you know, we have utmost respect for where uh, media comes from, but we've also been in the forefront of digital innovation from the beginning. Uh, so I think that's allowed us to, to look at the world in that way. 
Um, so when you start realizing that there isn't a service that can actually tell you how your content is doing in spite of, a, in spite of the platform, uh, it's a problem. You're like, you know, why am I going to rely on that? Like terrestrial TV is the least important to me of all the other expressions, yet it's the only data set I have to work with, and it's bad data to begin with. So I think the, the interesting moment for us right now is, you know, Latin America, as Ward was saying, uh, we always over-index in everything digital. And Latin America also always leap, leapfrogs with everything digital. So things might be happening in the US, and then in Latin America, somebody pushes for more connectivity in different countries, and that starts getting solved. And then you start seeing innovation coming through every sector, where, whether it's online banking, whatever you want, including media. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're seeing the numbers that you're seeing, a penetration of platforms like Netflix in Latin America. So what that means is that the Netflixes of the world that are desperate to have their hands on more content are starting to do original programming in the region with local partners, let's say, like us. But if you're going to produce for Netflix, you're going to have to start spending, you know, ten, tenfold yes. of what, what you, you, what what you, you want used to do than if you're just relying on your one terrestrial screen. Yes. So the stakes change. Drastically. So you're going to think really, really hard. You need great measurement in order to, ma to monetize. It's that. very different to produce a show for $2 million and to produce a show for $20 million. Yes. You're going to really think about it because you don't really want to mess up. That's a yeah. very big mistake if you don't get it right. So ratings become archaic because a rating is a reflection of the past through which you're trying to understand what might work in the future. What Parrot does is a reading of the exact moment and how content is doing that tells you what the future looks like. So why would you not work with that data set when you're trying to make informed decisions right. about production? Right. And are you finding that with your executive team, some of whom I think are even here in this audience, how, re uh, but not only your executive team, but your producers, the creative people you meet with, the marketers, the promoters, the distributors, are you finding them receptive to this or is there some, res you know, data is complicated. Everybody's receptive and now and I think everybody's receptive in a way that they wouldn't have been in Latin America two or three years ago because everybody's had to increase significantly how much money they're spending in production and it's, it's scary and it's painful so you don't want to mess it up. Yeah, yeah. There's that much at stake. Yeah. Which is why everybody wants to make sure that they can back up their, they can actually back up their decision to to not do a superhero show and do a cooking show instead, you know, whatever it is. Exactly. That's very, very interesting. Bruce, you come at it from a completely different direction, and you've been doing it for quite a while. Tell us what, how have your impressions changed about what, needs, what you need to do as an executive trying to sell into and relate to the Latin American market? What, do you, what have you seen that's different, thinking in terms of the ratings? Right. I, I think a couple of things, and I think it's well covered in this panel. The idea of surveying a small group of people and drawing a conclusion from that, extrapolating that this represents what 100 million or 400 million people or, or whatever watch, there's always a leap of faith there. And I suppose if you were trying to figure out pi to the 20th number and you were using an abacus, there's a leap of faith there as well. But ratings, survey-based, an abacus, physical stock being exchanged in a stock exchange. This is a very old way of doing things. So what we're seeing with data is you're actually counting real people rather than pretending from a sample set that you're counting real people. So, so the whole undermining of this is, is profound, but it's there and the alternatives are much more compelling. Now let's talk about the alternatives, something like Barrett. The hypothetical I would use now is uh, Ibope, these rating surveys, there's such big holes, not only in a premise, but in coverage. So you, you mentioned MGM before where I work, so I have no idea if MGM's actually doing this. But think about, about this as a buyer and a seller, if you were MGM. Uh, Handmaid's Tale, it's on Hulu. Nielsen doesn't cover that, and the, and the product is sold to terrestrial or cable broadcasters around the world. There's only Hulu in the U.S. and Japan. And how do you sell it? How do you sell it? How do you interpret to buy it? You know, mm -hmm. you're, you'll, be, you'll get a sales pitch. This is Handmaid's Tale, won an Emmy and a Golden Globe. Now, what are you going to pay for it if you have no data? Yeah, yeah. And if you want to sell it better, well, I've seen a lot of statistics that Ward has put together. You probably get a good price if you put all the data behind it in your sale. 
So what I guess I'm saying is for buyers, sellers, and when you're acquiring programming, by using this data and being able to just see it in, at so many levels, so deeply, so cut finely, you really can make smarter choices. You could still use your gut, but you have an overwhelming amount of facts on the ground you could look at to support or, or refute your own gut in the yeah. first instance. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, Adriana, when you look at uh, the kind of programming choices that you have to make and what you're going to make, and you can speak to both the Latin American market and the Hispanic market in the U.S., which I think is an extremely interesting market right now. Do you, are you yet able to use some of this new data to decide, okay, um, I guess I'm asking you, which programs, let's talk scripted for a minute, which programs do you think now need to be tweaked differently or maybe relegated to the back burner, no one really wants to watch them? Which ones are going to move to the forefront because of what you're seeing? Are, are, you, are you making some decisions about programming because of what you've gleaned so far? Uh, absolutely, and it, but it, there's layers and layers, right? And um, it goes beyond genre. Um, that's, that is very interesting, but that's a very big category. But it also, being able to work with something like Parrot um, gives people like us the opportunity when Netflix is trying to buy all the global rights for our programming forever and, and we're kind of freaking out. Um, when you look at Parrot, you can see in, in what order you should be releasing, in what order of screens you should be releasing um, your content. And certain content will do better uh, on an OTC platform. Some of, them, some of it will do better on a cable channel. And that's, that also becomes extremely interesting um, information because every media company now is multi-platform. So yes. you kind of have to make those decisions. And it's really nice to be able to have the tools so that you can actually negotiate those decisions instead of just having to deal with residual product yeah. um, after the, the Netflix acquisition. So it's actually affecting how you window product. Absolutely, 100%. Through its, its, its whole lifespan, which yep. can be seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. that's, that's amazing. Getting back to you, Warren, I'm, I'm looking at the affinity thing, uh, which you, you know, we, for lack of time, we didn't have that much time to talk about. But that would seem to me uh, a, a, a very, very interesting way of looking at how people are relating to media, especially when we're talking about the younger demos who I, you know, do interact with media in lots of different ways. Tell us a little bit more about yes, what, you're, what you've found and, and how surprised you've been at what you've found. Yes, affinity is one of the things that, um, you know, we're in a couple of minutes to dive into because it's one of the more bleeding edge types of analyses that are now coming out with these enormous data sets, you know, and I'm talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of data points um, that you need to process to, to map this, but um, it's, it's another form of understanding the popularity of content, right, and the impact that content, the value, the real value of content, right, if we would drill many layers to what is popular, right, it's like it's just genre, it's just the very tip of the iceberg, um, and it's not just for younger audiences, you can map the affinity of older demographics and, and across all cultures as well. Um, so this is what this is a cluster of 15 million people's consumption in, in a given month um, in the US looks like, right? These are 15 million people. Um, the way to read this chart is that every dot on the, on the chart represents um, a TV show. So there's 22, these 15 million people watch 22,000 TV shows mm -hmm. over the, that, this given month. And the, the brighter the dot, the more people watch that show. Mm -hmm. The lines represent the propagation of people from one TV show to the other. Now, when you visualize data, time series-based data, like this in one chart, right? This is a static picture that represents a month's worth of activity. Every line represents a propagation, a person moving from one TV show to the other. And when you map 15 million people, a cluster of 15 million people like this, you can start to draw out really, really interesting insights. For example, you can start to highlight where the niche content is. The niche content is, has a really, pop, really small group of users that love it. That's why they're, they're all the really, really bright dots, you can see bright dots are around the, the edges. These are 
TV shows that are really loved by a small group of users, that like consume them avidly, right? Um, but don't have high affinity with other TV shows. People just watch that one show and maybe they switch off, they go to sleep, they do other things, right? As opposed to a mainstream title, like say Game of Thrones, which is the center of this chart, um, this 50 million people is taken from the US. So that's a really popular TV show that has high affinity with lots of other TV shows. That means a, m a very broad audience watches that TV show, right? In this case, Game of Thrones, where um, they also watch a bunch of other titles, uh, other content as well. Um, you can start to draw out really interesting insights like loyalty. Um, with that meaning, if you're an Esval platform or you're selling to an Esval platform, you want to understand what impact does my, will, my, will my content have on your underlying user base? For example, if you know that you have a show that has a really high affinity with um, all the original series for a given Esval platform, um, then you also know that that show really va should be valued a lot for that given platform because if you remove that TV show, that title from the underlying user base, it's gonna have a downstream negative impact on the other titles around it. Um, so with this, you can map things like um, TV show uh, as well as entire network um, affinity. So you look at, for example, if we simplify that, it's an easier visualization, you look at Vikings, for example. People who watch Vikings, this is now looking across all of Latin America. People who watch Vikings, what are the top five highest affinity titles? Or they, people who watch Vikings also most frequently watch Game of Thrones, The Walking Dead, Suits, Westworld, and The 100. Right? And the size of the circles here represents how close the affinities are. So um, clearly, advertisers as well as executives absolutely. are going to be very interested in that kind of data, aren't they? In oh, terms really of yeah. where am I going to put my ads, my spots. And the really interesting thing is that we're seeing, for example, these are just, and this is a really interesting example, like you look at Club de Cuervos and you're seeing Naruto, a Japanese anime show, show up in the top five highest affinity titles for it in Latin America. Yeah. These are Latin American audiences um, for a local language show that have in the top five, a Japanese anime, a local Jack and Japanese anime showing up. I don't even know if Naruto airs across Latin America or what channels, or whether in fact it's even available in the market. But these audiences are finding it and they're consuming it. But to your, to your point, absolutely. We're seeing also, these are just content affinities, but we can do brand affinities. We know that people who like Empire, the TV show, in Japan also like Beats by Dre, the headphones, right? So we're starting to also infer brand relationships with TV shows, so to inform these advertising decisions as well as programming decisions. Okay, one quick question for all three of you. When I was walking over here, an old friend of mine, he's more on the creative side, of said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm running to moderate a panel. And he said, what's it about? And I quickly, because I couldn't explain it, I said, it's about data, and he said, Oh, that sounds deadening, Elizabeth. Now, he's a creative person, right? So my question really is, creative people, as a general rule, the, the, the writers, the ones that come up, the Vince Gilligans of the world, you know, the guy who did Breaking Bad, and, you know, all these others, these are instinctual people. They take risks. Um, they have stories to tell. They want to tell the stories that they want to tell, right? How are they, or how are you going to help them, each of you in your own way, realize that there is a way that data can help them? And I'm not saying they're all benighted people and they're blind to this, but nonetheless, they have a different mindset coming at this. How do we concretely get them to realize and utilize some of this information to help them take their story where the story will be most effective and most popular, right? Most of them do want their things to be seen as with a broader audience as possible. So what's, what do you do to make that happen? Bruce, let me start with you. What do you say to these folks? I, I'd say one of the odd things and a challenge about the internet generally over the last 20 years, um, there's too much jargon and there's too much fascination and discussion of how you bake the donuts, not the donut itself. Mm. And I think the challenge for creatives sometimes is they keep hearing algorithms, data-driven, but what they should be looking at is something like this chart. It doesn't matter, it's just these are actually counted human beings as opposed to Nielsen's guess, and this is kind of what it is. This is something that is probably what a creative can and should look at without getting just bogged down and the whole jargon. I mean, it's akin to 
a painter and all everyone talks about is how the paintbrush was made. Mm -hmm. Just use mm -hmm. the brush and go paint it. And I think that's where we're getting in terms of technology. We're now getting it to a point that it becomes so user friendly and what's important is to see and work with the end result and not how things are made along the way. Yeah, Adriana, from your perspective, how, no. how does this work with, with the producers that your company has to give a green light to or no? And Well, I mean, to begin with, if it's my money, I'm gonna run the idea through the algorithm and it's either gonna go to production or not. But I think- And they all know this, all these creatives, they, yeah. know, they know what you're gonna do. Yeah. Okay. But I think, um, I think the point about what Parrot does here is that it's a very human side to data and, and all the data sets are human expressions. And I think that's a very, that is a very powerful tool. And the moment that you start playing around with them with the platform or even just read the reports that they publish, you actually realize that it's endlessly interesting. Um, and it's not there to replace the creation of good ideas. That's not what it does. It's just there to inform you as to how you can make sure that idea is successful. So, I mean, if there are any creatives still out there that are gonna reject completely the idea of, a, of, a, of using data to be smarter with their production, well, good luck with they that. must be ending their career pretty soon, yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, that's, that's a key part. And, and it goes way beyond, way beyond, um, an idea, it has more to do, like you can even use it to figure out what, what arch of a story, what's the length of a story, what arch, how the arch should develop to be more successful in what markets. That stuff is really interesting. And it's not, you know, listen, media companies have been using data for a very long time. It just, it just we were assembling it differently and it used to take a very, very long time to be able to do an informed decision. So it's not like data has never been a part of the conversation. Data has always been a part of the conversation. I remember as a little girl that we would see our executives come back from different countries with the newspapers because back then the TV companies would print their... Um, the top ratings, right? The ratings yes. and their month by month uh, schedule grid on the newspaper. and. The data team at our network would assemble all of that into a data set that then we would use to do informed decisions for our distribution company. It's always been part of it, but this is a lot more fun. It's a lot more accurate. Uh, and frankly, it's just stupid to not use this type of data to do a production. Exactly. Wari, what, what, what do you do? Have you, I mean, in terms of your client base, I'm guessing they're more uh, uh, production companies and, and distributors and advertisers, but. Have you dealt with the creative producers at all, and how are they responding? What, what, what's your takeaway from that? I love that analogy that you said, Bruce, about the, this is the brush, use it to paint, yeah. right? I'm gonna openly steal that from now on. Um, <laughs> I, I relate to it personally, because yeah, I, you know, I, I used to do a lot of painting, and I think that's probably the most accurate way to describe it, is that actually, here is just, it's a better br brush, right? It's, uh, you know, it draws clearer lines, it has more depth, if you're doing oil, oil painting, without getting too technical, it's, it's a better brush. But we're not telling you how to paint your painting, right? That process, I mean, there's, there's, you know, we talk about execution risk and new creative projects and so on. That's just, that's the difference between a really, really good painter and a, and a bad painter. You can give them the same brush, but they can produce vastly different quality paintings. And so this doesn't guarantee success. And, you know, it's not, it's never like that. And so I think that's probably the most accurate way to do it is actually if you, if you make this so easy to use for both um, business decision makers as well as the creatives, then essentially it's just a better brush. But we're not telling them, and I, I probably wouldn't be comfortable telling a creative, any creative, any artist, how to do their job, yeah. right? Because they know that infinitely better than any of us do. And so all you can do is just provide the tool, the, the, the paint or the brush and say, here's a blank canvas, use it to paint, but that's, you know, that's your creativity, right? So you don't want to tell them how to paint, rather um, just give them a, a better tool okay. so they can... They can... To, to, to wrap up, I just want to ask you, looking forward, like the next, we all look forward, the next couple of years, since there's been so much change in the last two or three, looking forward from each of your perspectives, w w what do you see what do you see happening? What would you like to see happening, keeping the whole data question in mind? I mean, starting with you, Warren, is there a metric? Is there a thing, a nugget that we haven't yet seen, that you haven't yet been able to quantify or measure that you're now working on? 
and I'm and maybe the other two will tell you which ones they'd like to know that we haven't seen. What what's the company? Where are you going to take the company in the next couple of years? Sure. Look, I think we're just we really are just starting to scratch the surface of the soul, right? I, I said we're working on this for five years, but it's only now that you have a ver an intersection of various number of technologies that are allowing us to do analyses like this, like really vast scale. And, uh, and that's the cloud infrastructure, data processing ca capability, new types of graphing databases and so on. And so these are technological advances which are also impacting the media industry from an internet broadband penetration and so on. I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of, of, of this all. And I, you know, I'm going to take the humble approach and say we, we actually, even though we think we're at the bleeding edge of this, we still don't know what we don't know in terms of what is yet to come because we're still uncovering new types of analysis, analyses and insights. And, and I think this whole, there's a, like, look, there's a sign that where we say this is, this is where art meets science. And I think that's, it probably summarizes it because there's an entire element of art. We're, we're venturing into this element of art, which is very nebulous. Um, we, we still don't know what we don't know about this. What we do know is that we can now make very systematic decisions, and we can now understand how popular or how much demand there is for any piece of content anywhere on the planet, regardless of what window or platform it's on. And that's really exciting. Yeah, Adriana, what would you like to see? What will help you yeah, in I, the next couple of years? I think uh, what, I, what I dream of using sort of the, the two sides of, of my brain in the industry um, is I think very soon uh, we're going to be able to use Parrot to identify the right products to do product integrations into original programming. And I think that will revolutionize the way that you think about your advertisers and what you can potentially do with them. This is more than sponsorship. This is about getting the pretty subtle stuff. <laughs> OK. And it will help you because, I mean, you own a company that is, uh, I mean, you are commercially backed. So you want your advertisers to you know, but think, you know, think if, to, you know, to the find next, these new ways. Think They're how very amazing if, if Warren can meet with the team behind the next Bond movie and actually prove to them which would be the best watch, the best car, and the best airplane to actually have be part of that movie instead of doing it because of, you know. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Bruce, what, what do you think? Well, I, I would look at it even in the next couple of months, and just very practically speaking, for anyone here, and I, I ran networks over the years, networks that are buying third-party TV shows, I would urge you, if you are doing that, to tell whoever's buying for you when they come up and they say sign off on CSI or whatever this, sign off on the budget, to say show me all the other shows you were also thinking of and how they stacked up against each other on Parrot because I need more data because otherwise I'm just, you know, I'm just going on faith and faith is a good thing to go on but data really is going to make people, as, as Adriana is saying, much much, Much more, more religious. <laughs> yes, so. it would be more faithful. So that's what I would suggest. I want to thank this uh, fabulous panel, Warren, Adriana, Bruce. They are amazing and such an attentive audience. Thank you all. You've got a lot to do. Thank you. Thank you.